So once upon a time, uh, humankind was an agricultural society. In fact, we were an agricultural society for most of our history. About 250 years ago, James Watt invented the, power, uh, the steam engine. It was the first time there was a mechanical product that had more power than a human, more strength. And then about 50 years ago, we had the invention of the microprocessor, which sort of rushed in the, the new information digital age that we're living in today. Um, I, I'm confident to predict that the, this century will be known as the age of AI. And uh, just to give you a feeling what's been happening here, uh, I, I was looking for one statistic. Uh, 10 years ago, in 2009, there was 100 papers uh, on machine learning published that year. Last year, it was 100 papers a day. So this is about the most rapid growing uh, field of scientific interest, of business interest, of inquiry, what's uh, going on here. Uh, to me, the, the first picture that I remember about AI that really sort of got my attention was uh, the Google cat. Uh, this dated back to 2012, and this apparently happens when the computer watches billions of hours of YouTube videos of cats, and then it figures out that's what a cat looks like. Uh, but it, is, it was actually learned just from watching YouTube. And this was all inspired by, and all net, neural networks are inspired by the way the human brain works, which is what nature optimized for billions of years, excuse me, millions of years. And uh, in the brain, there's obviously multiple layers of the cortex, and maybe there's five or seven. But in the end, you know, we see a cat, we know it's a cat. Um, and the most amazing thing of the brain is that our neurons are incredibly slow. They take about 100 milliseconds to fire. I'm sorry, um, so in, sorry, they take about 10 milliseconds to fire. So in the 100 milliseconds that it takes us to recognize a cat, we only have 10 neurons firing. If, I mean, and the brain runs on about 20 watts of power. So the kind of power efficiency that nature has provided us with is, is unmatched you know, in the computer world. Now, uh, the same attribute, of course, is true for, for uh, seeing things, hearing things, feeling emotions of others. So the, the efficiency of our human uh, brain to recognize things is amazing. Uh, when people started to mirror these kind of models in the computer, back in 2012, um, you know, they, they looked at millions of images. There's a competition called ImageNet. 16.4% error rate, not too good. Uh, by 2014, uh, they, people realized that the more layers you add, the more accurate the prediction gets. 6.6 uh, .6 error rate, human performance on this test about 5%. And this actually kept improving. The, the final result of ImageNet, they're going to change the benchmark now, um, is 2.3% error rate, which is substantially better than, than human performance. And um, this kind of leads to like, what kind of applications does this have? Um, obviously, watching, I don't know, uh, security cameras uh, is not a promising job for the future because a, a computer will be able to do that much better than any humans and not get tired to 24 hours a day. Um, uh, Google has had some surprising good results in diagnosing eye diseases uh, where compared to human experts, uh, which have an average or median score of 91, the algorithm actually performed at 95% accuracy which doesn't mean that the computer should replace, replace the human, but in many countries, um, there's not enough doctors, eye doctors, to look into people's eyes to diagnose their issues, and computers could be enormously helpful to, to improve health. Um, now, beyond image recognition, um, we have teaching assistants. Uh, this is an example back to 2016, where uh, IBM sponsored a um, teaching assistant called Jill Watson to answer questions computers, uh, students had in the computer uh, artificial intelligence class. The surprising thing about this experiment was that the students were actually not aware they were talking to a computer, except one guy uh, in the middle of the night, he sent a message, this was the text-based interaction, at three o'clock in the morning, and the computer answered right away, and he said, well, that's amazing, it's almost like talking to a computer. <laughs> this was the AI class, okay? But the way it really worked is the computer would answer all the questions where it had high confidence in the answer, and the few questions where it didn't have high confidence, it sent back to a human. Now, obviously, you can uh, apply this to other fields. There was a recent competition at Stanford where, I, I, sh I should know which one was better, both Alibaba and Microsoft outscored humans on this Wikipedia test where the computer would ingest all of Wikipedia and would answer questions about Wikipedia, like 100,000 questions, and you know, this has significant impl uh, implications for uh, applications in customer service and so on. 
Um, moving on to language translation, um, this has been around for a while, but there has been recent improvements that it get it very close. It's not perfect, uh, but very close to human performance. The, the upper bar in this chart is human performance. The green bar is where the uh, Google Neural Network machine translation pops in, and the blue one is where they were uh, prior to that improvement. Um, and again, it's not quite human performance was very good. Uh, a, a much more interesting or amazing thing to me is that Google can now translate voice to voice without even going to text. So this will allow people to speak into their uh, smartphone or whatever and out comes the other language uh, in their tone of voice, uh, which is truly amazing. So um, games has been preoccupied uh, computer scientists for a long time because it seems such a simple thing. The problem is combinatorial and explosion. The game of Go, of course, has so many combinations, nobody could ever do it with brute force. Uh, and um, Google Go, I'm sorry, AlphaGo, which is a Google uh, uh, effort in 2016, as you remember, won the World Championship by training this program on uh, with, uh, with human games, with human experts, and then it actually beat the world champion. Uh, you may not actually remember what happened afterwards, because the same team, this is the Google Brain team, uh, the DeepMind team, um, asked the question, what would have happened if we hadn't done any training at all and just given the computer the, the rules of the game, uh, but then the computer should train itself? And the answer was uh, this program called Alpha Zero, which within seven hours of self-training on a whole bunch of uh, Google TPU chips actually beat the previous program, which was the one that beat the world champion, and then it kept on improving itself to the point that it's substantially better than the original program. The same program, Alpha Zero, was then applied to both chess and shoji. Uh, the previous world champion chess program is called a, a Stockfish, which is a brute force search. It evaluates 80 million positions per second. It's really amazing, except Alpha Zero, within four hours of training, and again, without any prior knowledge except knowing the rules of the game and the objective to win, of course, would beat that program. And for Soji, it took them two hours of self-training to build that. Um, and again, the, the other interesting aspect here is the Alpha Zero program evaluates only about one thousandth the position of, um, of Stockfish. So instead of 80 million moves looking ahead, it only looks at 80,000 per second. Um, the most recent uh, development that got a lot of people uh, nervous is this thing called Generative Adversarial Networks. This was invented, I think, in 2016 uh, by Mr. Goodfellow at the University of Toronto. And um, it can generate things that look real, but they're not. In this particular picture, um, you know, this is actually a, a, a quiz test. Which of these pictures are real and which ones are fake? They're all fake. Um, uh, this has been applied to art. You know, you can take your, a picture of your dog, then you relate it to, say, Picasso style and tell the program to paint your dog Picasso style, and it looks pretty good. Um, uh, you, of course, you can apply it to any artist, so Monet, Van Gogh, Cezanne, whatever your favorite is. Um, the, the conversions are actually quite amazing, which makes me believe that you know, there will be a lot of computer art in the future. Uh, but some paintings have been created that were actually auctioned off at uh, Sotheby's, Although it wasn't clear who actually owns the copyright on this, the computer or the human who wrote the program. Uh, in any event, um, one of the most powerful things lately is to creating realistic looking images from sketches. The human input is the thing on the left, basically a very, very coarse sketch. The computer renders this beautiful picture on the right in you know, real time, essentially. Um, there's been a great demo of uh, imaginary Hollywood uh, fake celebrities. This is an hour-long YouTube video. I mean, they, they look like real people, but it's just one of the other one, uh, all artificially created. And uh, surprising things like lip reading. So uh, University of Oxford wrote this program that was better than any human to read people's lips without hearing the sound with an amazing 93% accuracy. Best human performance on this task, 52%. Now, this has led to this topic of fake news, uh, fake videos, sorry, <laughs> not fake news, fake videos. Uh, uh, otherwise known as real-time reenactment where some actor you know, moves around and says something. It's then mapped to a target, uh, in this case a, a politician, and then the output looks like that politician saying the same words. Uh, this is surprisingly easy to do. In fact, you can do it on your, your laptop these days. Um, and uh, the next challenge, of course, is how to detect the fact that these things are fake. Um, th there's been some papers uh, 
by University of Berkeley, and there's actually a lot of research in Germany going on on this. Um, it, it comes down to detecting the authenticity of the movement, the voice, and so on. Um, the latest result by this Technical University of Munich people is that you can actually get up to 99% accuracy on the detection part if you have it as high quality. Unfortunately, the more uh, compressed the video gets, the, the more resolution it loses, the harder it gets to detect the fake because the artifacts created by compression are similar to the artifacts you're trying to detect. So this is a challenge. Um, so we shouldn't believe everything we see anymore. And this will be around. Um, let me switch topics for a second, talking about the chips that people are working on. Um, so AI uh, in the cloud, uh, especially for a company like Google, that wants to service you know, millions uh, or billions of users worldwide, millions of requests per second, with a goal to service each of these requests in tens of milliseconds. It's an incredible computational task. Uh, people are developing special chips for this now, but it's clearly maybe a hundred to thousand fold more computational intensive than the resources these large companies have today. And uh, the quick history here is that uh, conventional CPUs, Intel, AMD, and so on, are, are kind of topping out in clock rate and, and parallelism. I mean, yes, you can add more cores, but it's not ideal for AI. One big difference with CI is it's not very precise. You only need like 8-bit or 16-bit precision, not 32-bit or 64-bit. And you also want a lot more parallelism. There's a lot of stuff going on, more like a data flow kind of machine, a systolic processing. So people now around the globe are developing incredibly interesting new chips and architectures to accelerate AI uh, compared to even the best CP GPUs and CPUs able today. A good example is the uh, Google TPU chips. They're on the third generation. Uh, this rack of, I guess it's 16 racks, this cluster of machines has a peak performance of 100 petaflops and uh, they're working on their exaflop kind of version next. Um, one uh, good thing about AI and, and these kind of chips is that the, this, the speed up or the scaling uh, potential is very, very linear. Uh, the dotted curve is like theoretical uh, linear and the green curve is what they measured on TPU2, so it looks pretty good. Um, and so we would expect that they will be able to reach their goals here in the next few years. Um, let me talk about now the, the implications of AI on the uh, broader uh, economy. So there's been an incredible amount of startup activity, as you probably heard, especially in the US. Um, last quarter, there was reported Q219. Uh, AI subs were funded at a tune of $7.4 billion in one quarter. That's more than the venture capital in all of Germany for the year. Um, and this has been crept up sort of steadily over the last many, many years. Um, if t this run rate year, this year, venture capital is 100 billion, AI may be over 20% of all venture capital is going to AI startups, which is really amazing. Um, many of these, uh, quite a few of these companies actually were already acquired by Google and Facebook and other companies. So a lot of activity there. Um, people keep, it, there's actually thousands of companies. Actually, if you want to do a startup these days, you have to include the word AI, you know, to get funded. But uh, uh, there's, uh, some companies have raised billion dollar plus at, at unicorn kind of valuations to do robotic process automation and healthcare and, and other things that are all very important. So this is just a, a listing of 100 startups that are sort of more visible than perhaps others. Um, in terms of the market opportunity, looking just for enterprise, I'm sorry, AI for enterprise applications, meaning the companies that would sell some type of service to an existing enterprise. Um, somebody made a forecast here that predicts that by 25, this will be at least 30 billion. Okay, sounds good. Um, but if you look at the broader implication, uh, clearly AI will assist all kinds of business process going forward. And the best way in my mind to think about the future work that we all do is, you know, we will have to combine human and artificial intelligence in the best way. And this gets down to productivity, quite frankly. Um, if, you know, if you ask any company, any Fortune 500, any German company, you know, what, what would you do to increase your sales productivity by 20% or cut your customer service cost with, by half or, accelerate your drug discovery 10 times or just design products that you couldn't think of before, they all will jump at the opportunity because it's the best way to stay ahead. So the, the biggest uh, opportunity for AI is actually large companies that can increase the market position by taking advantage of all the data they have and all the resources they have to bring better products to market more quickly. Um, and uh, a McKinsey company and, uh, studied this in a, in a white paper on AI use cases 
This is about a year ago. So they looked at, uh, across all different industries, 400 use cases, um, you know, basically primarily large companies. But what they found is that any company that's doing any analytics can improve the results immediately just deploying AI. And the potential impact vary, of course, by the industry, but are across the world between 100 and 600 dollars per industry. And there's hundreds of applications that people could do right now. Uh, so the low-hanging fruit, if you will, is improving analytics of data that people already have, collecting more data, improving the results, right? And um, the average improvement, uh, a little hard to see here, um, at the low for like for defense, 30%, at the high for travel, 128%, average 60% sounds good. Translating this to numbers worldwide, they believe this has the potential to increase the economic value of 3.5 trillion US dollars to 5.8. The US trillions are like milliard, how would it in Germany? They're always different, but it's roughly the size of the German economy. But that's actually the low-hanging fruit. If you really apply AI to everything, their forecast is it's between 10 and 15 trillion, which is a little smaller than the US economy, but we're talking about value creation of a scale that's close to, let's call it, half of this country. So that's very, very significant. So the key question, of course, is will people buy into this, right? You know, if you watch the Hollywood movies, it's all scary, gloom and doom. The Terminator's taking over. Um, well, consumers, which are the ultimate judge here, will only accept technology that helps them, that they will only accept technology that makes them feel respected. They will only take technology they can trust. So, for example, co consumers hate talking to a computer that has a computer voice, you know, because it makes them feel stupid. Whereas if the computer has an emotional voice, you know, like something like in the movie Her, H-E-R, that makes it fun to talk to, they would actually talk to it, right? So, yes, AI still has to improve, and particularly it has to relate to humans in a way that humans enjoy relating to, but the potential, of course, is enormous. And, you know, the, the hardest thing to earn these days is trust. So companies who want to be successful here have to earn the trust of the consumer and, and keep it this way and not violate it. Um, talking about trust, uh, so people make these service now, uh, surveys, who, who can you trust? Um, and of course, knowing how to tr who to trust is everything, to quote a recent James Bond movie. Um, <laughs> it turns out, the highest, in, at least in the US, the highest trust is still in the US military. Let's hope this continues. Followed by Amazon, surprisingly. So <laughs> you order your package, it arrives, it's great followed by Google, hmm, okay. Now Facebook is a little lower here, but look at the bottom rank, press, political parties, Congress, hmm. Um, trust in government, historic lows, so the highest trust, and this is a different uh, research center that asks this question every year. They actually break it down by political party. I've shown you the aggregate, so. Um, it, it had a high in the Eisenhower Kennedy days, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, it was, you know, people really trusted government. It kind of first collapsed with the, uh, the big recession in the late 1970s. It kind of picked back up during the Clinton years and during the first dot-com boom, surprisingly. And then by the time the last recession hit, it was back down to you know, record low levels and has been dibble around that level ever since. Not too good. Um, so to summarize this, you know, there is a huge opportunity here from an economic perspective to improve productivity prosperity, wealth, accelerating innovation, you name it, across essentially all industries. And what, what is true is that those companies and those countries that adopt these technologies have an inherent advantage. In other words, you don't want to be the company or the country who lags behind. It is a race, okay? Now, at the same token, the consumers who are the ultimate judge of this have to embrace these technologies, and they will if it benefits them and it makes them feel respected and if they can trust it. Um, my last slide here is a, a picture of a beautiful, uh, I don't know if it's a sunset or moon glitter on the ocean. And what I want to emphasize here is this thing called the horizon effect. This was an early concept in AI where you, know, you search for something, but you only look five steps ahead. And the answer was right after the fifth step, and you never found it because you didn't look so far. But you could also think about this as the world before Christopher Columbus, where you know, people looked out on this ocean and they didn't believe there was something on the other side of the ocean until somebody tried to find it. So what you don't want to do is basically sort of cap the opportunity in front of mankind here in terms of limiting the number of options going forward. 
because there's, there could be completely undiscovered and you know, new countries out there that we haven't seen yet in the world of AI and computer science. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, do you have room for any questions? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. No, no questions, sir. No, thank you. That was uh, a fantastic tour de force from one of the big names here in Silicon Valley, somebody who has seen uh, a number of decades of disruptive change. And I think it was very skillfully done because he first showed us what, you know, what AI can do. And some of these things are truly impressive, uh, sometimes a little bit scary. Right? Then he started talking about trust. And, and here, it's really interesting to see that on one hand, we trust, uh, uh, you know, we, it was interesting to see we trust Amazon and Google. On the other hand, we increasingly uh, get the feeling that some things are off on privacy. And we feel that year on year, things are getting worse for privacy. How do you define trust? How do you define trust for yourselves? And how do businesses who innovate generate that trust? And who instills that trust? Is it the government? Should it be corporate? the corporate sector? Should it be civil society? Uh, should it be a convening like this that generates definitions of trust? Right? And then really leaving with the, the horizon picture, there is a really important challenge for all of us. As we react to the potential and the scariness of some of this, are we being short-sighted that we're not seeing the potential? Are we just seeing what we are and who we are and are we scared based on who we want to stay rather than who we could become with the help of AI? I get that that is even more scary and it comes full circle to trust. The innovators need to show us that we can trust them and then we'll lean forward, right? So I thought a very, very skillfully done talk.